Bowling for Charity. Eric Gagne, who pitches right-handed but is naturally left-handed, held his inaugural bowling extravaganza in Hollywood. His charity benefits kids in need. With help of auctioned memorabilia, the Dodgers closer simply said, hey, it's his way of giving back. I got two healthy kids, one, another one on the way, and I think I'm really fortunate. And uh, just to raise some money for them, I think that's a fun event. It's easy. And uh, just to give back to the community a little bit. And, uh, you know, we have a day off today. It's only a couple hours on our schedule. And uh, try to raise as much money as possible. And, uh, I mean, my kids are so special. I'm really fortunate they're healthy. So just to try to help them a little bit, give them hopes. Gagne told me he was inspired by going to Children's Hospital. Well, Shaq and Kobe will spend Christmas together at least on the court. The NBA has released its upcoming schedule, and the sequel to last year's holiday treat will be played in Miami this year. ABC will start its coverage that day with a finals rematch between the Spurs and the Pistons. The Clippers open in Seattle on November 2nd. The Lakers on that same night open in Denver. Finally, speaking of Shaq, he'll be carrying a gun around the state of Virginia the next couple of days. Shaq was sworn in as a deputy sheriff in Bedford County, part of a new department that's cracking down on Internet predators. While he works on his certification, Shaq will be talking to local kids and their parents about the dangers of online predators. Shaq is always doing great things in the community, isn't he? It's wonderful. Yeah. All right. Kurt, That's thanks great. a lot. You're welcome. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Trezor, 15 years of love. Now with the ring adorned with Swarovski crystals. Wear it and be treasured. Lancome, your gift of beauty with any 2650 Lancome purchase. Only at Robinson's May. Something new, we've been there. Okay, folks. <sighs> Why not make a smaller one? SeaWorld's got more. More up-close encounters. More spectacular splashes. More thrills like the rush of Journey to Atlantis. And more new shows and attractions than ever. Plus, here's one more reason to visit SeaWorld this summer. Southern California residents save $11 through September 5th. This Californian can't save energy by installing compact fluorescent bulbs. But you can save energy, money, and the environment. Flex your power for all Californians. And when you hear flex your power now, turn off any unnecessary lights. Closed captioning for Eyewitness News at 11 here on ABC7 is brought to you by Chevy and American Revolution. Supercharged for 2005. An alleged hit-and-run driver has been nabbed on the streets of Ann Arbor, Michigan, all because of a group of cheerleaders turned into crime fighters. The cheerleaders were working out on campus when they saw a truck run into a car and then leave the scene. The cheerleaders' coach started running down the street after the suspect. I'm running down the street chasing the truck and calling off the numbers, and the girls could hear me, and they got the letters. The coach ran back and dialed 911 on her cell phone as the cheerleaders kept chanting the suspect's <laughs> license plate number. Police heard the chants, they wrote the number down, and the suspect was tracked down a short time later. It's got to be a first, huh? <laughs> oh, that's it for us here at 11 o'clock. Nightline is next, followed by Jimmy Kimmel. Eyewitness News returns tomorrow at 5 a.m. Thanks for watching. Good night. Good music, good times. What's your favorite thing in the whole world? 
Yes? I don't know. You don't know? Well, it's good that you raised your hand, then. Tonight, Kevin Nealon and an all-new Jimmy Kimmel Live. Good times, late night tonight, only on ABC. We are, it turns out, not much different from any other family when one of our own is critically ill. For quite a few weeks now, many of Peter Jennings' colleagues here at ABC News have suspected, and some have even known, that he was dying. But when outsiders asked, and of course they asked all the time, we would take refuge behind some evasion like, well, you know what a fighter Peter is. If anyone can beat this thing, he can. Well, he couldn't, and he didn't. So for the past 24 hours, those of us who were his friends have been responding to a slew of requests for interviews about Peter. And inevitably, they come out sounding as though Peter had been some sort of journalistic replica of a plaster saint. Well, he wasn't. He was a spirited, wonderful, flawed, sometimes infuriating, but always fascinating man. He was catnip to women. And that was a role he relished throughout most of his life. It does not diminish in the least the great love he had for his wife, Casey, to point out that before he met and wooed her, Peter had been married three other times. Peter and I met 41 years ago covering the presidential campaign of Barry Goldwater. This photograph was taken in the summer of 1964 in Atlantic City when Lyndon Johnson received the Democratic nomination for president. Two ambitious young men who got pretty much everything they were dreaming of back then. Peter's life was much too short, but oh, what a lot he packed into his 67 years. Last fall, at an event sponsored by the New Yorker magazine, Peter, Dan Rather, and Tom Brokaw participated in a panel moderated by Ken Oletta. Uh, which, which broadcast journalist who'd had, in our cases, 30, 40 years of experience, would not have wanted to be at the center to try to guide the coverage of a news division through that extraordinary period. You guys are the 800-pound gorillas. You what? are esteemed, and rightly so, by... No, we're also reviled by a lot of people. No, no, but, but you have... <laughs> uh, that is true, too. Uh, <laughs> but you have, you have uh, enormous power, as you said. What happens in the next generation that replaces you? Will they have that kind of power? I, I, the one thing I think that the next generation will, may uh, regret or resent a little has to do with the changing aspects of the business. We were all given lots and lots of time to be reporters. You know, Dan started in, you know, Dan for me goes back to Vietnam. Tom goes back to the White House for me. I spent much of my adult career as a foreign correspondent. Thank God I, I covered Islam in those days, because it's turned out to be extraordinarily useful to me. I'm a little nervous that the next generation will not have had as much opportunity in the field as we have. And I think they'll find that, they'll, I think they'll resent their corporations a little bit for not having had the time. And joining me now, the two men who shared the stage that night with Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw, who is in McLeod, Montana tonight, and Dan Rather, who is joining us in the middle of his night in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm very grateful to both of you for joining us. Um, but uh, let's, be, let's be frank about this. You two guys and Peter spent 20 years trying to beat one another's brains in. Uh, <laughs> and, and if we can, let's, at the end of this very long day here, Talk about the competition a little bit. Dan, do you, do you want to start? What kind of a competitor was Peter? And uh, did you fear him, take him for granted, uh, enjoy his company when you were on the same story? How did it work for you? As a competitor, Peter was daunting. Um, he, inside that handsome experience, always prepared, debonair, charming, inside that exterior, was a, a fierce but principled competitor. Uh, Peter wanted to win. Tom, uh, you and Peter shared something in common, and uh, I'm, I'm old enough, just a couple of days uh, away from you, that I can talk about these things now. You were both, when you got into this business, cute as a button, and both of you, uh, <laughs> both of you were slammed with being so damn good looking that nobody believed you could ever be good reporters. Just talk about the difficulties that you both shared in that regard. 
But Peter in particular, who was an anchor at this extraordinarily young age of 26, it was a terrible experience for him. Well, I remember when I met Peter uh, in 1966, uh, we were about a year apart at that time, and he was the boy wonder of ABC News, but um, it was coming apart on him. And a lot of local stations in Los Angeles and uh, Chicago and other places were throwing a lot of big money at him to go to Chicago, go to Los Angeles, anchor the local news. And what I admired about Peter uh, is that he made this decision to walk away from the anchor desk take himself overseas, become a foreign correspondent, grunt, and work so hard at uh, reestablishing his credentials. So when he came back to the anchor chair, he was prepared. When you ask Dan about the competitive factor, we've spent a lot of time, the three of us, in the last year, Dan, Peter, and I. And Peter had this great line about, um, he said, people often ask, are we friends? And he said, we are friends, because we don't see each other that often. And then he went on to say, we believe that we've all made each other better at what we do through the competition, and we have these shared values as correspondents. And I thought there was an essential truth in all of that. Uh, we were at a reflective stage in our lives and our careers, and God knows, uh, at that time, no one expected that it would come to this kind of an end for Peter, which makes it all the more heartbreaking. Dan, pick up the theme that, uh, that Peter was talking about in his response to Canaletta. This, this problem uh, of most of our successors not having the opportunity uh, to cut their teeth out in the field as you did, as Tom did, as Peter did, as I did. Uh, people being thrown into anchordom a little bit too early, too soon. Peter was concerned about this, and I think we, we all are to a degree. The business has changed greatly in another important aspect, and that is that the three main over-the-airways networks have all been um, made a part of larger entities. In the case of CBS with Viacom, the case of NBC with GE, and the case of ABC with Disney. And as the news divisions of networks became part of much larger worldwide conglomerates, uh, there was there less airtime was made available. Uh, the distance between the very top ownership and leadership of these huge worldwide corporations became more distant. And so he was referring to both of those things in the sense that, yes, it makes it more difficult for an idealistic, well-motivated young person to make of him or herself today what Peter and Tom made of themselves when they were coming up. One last quick question to the both of you. What, uh, what Dan, do you think is the, we talked about the things we hope can be replaced and can be continued. What would you say is the one most irreplaceable thing about our old friend Peter? His uniqueness. Peter was an excellent reporter, writer, natural as a broadcaster. Uh, he could do it all. He was never a reader, always a leader and never more a leader than championing strong, integrity-based overseas coverage. I won't say it can't be replaced. It's going to be extremely difficult to be replaced. And Peter's uniqueness as, as an individual, that whole package of having leading man looks, uh, being a correspondent scholar, and of the bravery of a knight, uh, that's a rare thing to find in any person, uh, including any journalist. Tom? Well, he had all these inherent abilities. He, his great broadcasting facility, he looked the part of an anchor man, but he never treated it as birthright. He went out and earned his place, and he never lost his passion for what he was doing. You know, Ted, that whatever Peter was involved in, he thought was the greatest thing in the world at that moment, in his profession and in his life. And there was a, an infectious quality about that, and it also made him very appealing as a friend, even when I had differences with him. I always found him very engaging and fun to bang heads with. Nothing would have pleased him more than, than to hear tributes from the two of you, uh, whom I know he respected so much. I thank you, Tom Brokaw, Dan Rather, Dan especially. Uh, let me say again, in Beirut, Lebanon, it is very late at night or early in the morning, and both of you are very gracious to join us tonight. Thank you. When we come back, Peter Jennings, a rough start to a brilliant career. I like to see my name in print. It gives me a sense of exhilaration.
This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Sprint. With Sprint, people are experiencing BMW in a whole new way. Using wireless kiosks powered by Sprint, customers can build their own all-new 3 Series and ask for a test drive. Because the more new people BMW reaches, the more BMWs wind up on the road. With Sprint, BMW is accessible, interactive, beautiful. Learn more at Sprint.com. Wednesday, celebrate an extraordinary life. Peter Jennings, reporter. ABC Wednesday at 8, 7 central. Start the search for your next car at CarMax. Instead of driving around all day, come to where you can compare features and options and test drive nearly every make and model on one lot. So start your search today. CarMax, the way car buying should be. Start your used car search at CarMax. We've sold more guaranteed quality used cars than anyone else in America. So if you want to know what a high quality used car looks like, come to CarMax and just take a look. CarMax, the way car buying should be. Hi, I'm Mike Sosha. Lately, one team in Southern California has been attracting fans at a record pace. That team is Howard's. Why are fans choosing Howard's over the national chain stores? First of all, Howard's has a huge selection of appliances and big and flat screen TVs. They have guaranteed low prices on everything they sell. Their sales staff is the most knowledgeable in the game. They offer next day delivery seven days a week. And fans are going home happy. Go to Howard's and go home happy. To understand the anchorman, Peter Jennings, whom most of you knew so well, you need to go back to 1965 and the very young anchorman that many of you may not have known at all and most people have forgotten. I like to be recognized. I think anybody who doesn't like to be recognized is a damn fool. This was the first incarnation of Peter Jennings as an anchor. He was 26 years old. How long is this? Picked for his good looks and energy, dreading the Glamour Boy label. I want to reach the point where Walter Cronkite or his counterpart at that future date will say, Peter Jennings is a good news correspondent. He is a good broadcaster. That's terribly important. Among the many ABC News colleagues who work closely behind the scenes with Peter, I have asked three to join me tonight. Bob Siegenthaler produced documentaries with a very young Peter Jennings during the mid-1960s. Gretchen Babarovich, Peter's longtime assistant, and Mike Clemente, Peter's longtime senior writer on World News Tonight. And I'm going to do this um, chronologically, so Bob, I'm going to begin with you. And I must confess to you that I've been slandering you for years. Uh, because uh, I remember there was an occasion when the young Peter, who I guess was about 26, made so bold uh, as to offer a suggestion at an editorial meeting when he had begun anchoring. And someone, I thought it was you, I've been told it was not, said icily, Peter, why don't you go back to your office and finish coloring your book? Can you understand what it was that caused people to treat Peter that way when he began anchoring the first time around? Well, I think it was because of his uh, movie star looks. It was Cary Grant with a reporter's notebook. And that was quite intimidating for him. And he was also smart. What was it uh, that, that made the first time in the anchor desk or at the anchor desk fail? Well, I uh, first had uh, contact with Peter. He came and it was given to me, in effect, to 
work on a program in, called World Prospects 1965. I believe that's still poised to run. It, it was so bad, uh, and it was thought that if Peter were the anchor, we could take the pieces, rewrite some of them, and perhaps save it. And we attempted to do that, and uh, Peter unfortunately referred to someone as a lieutenant and uh, some events scheduled for later in the year and we realized that uh, that the Canadian transition uh, might not be as smooth as one would have wanted. Gretchen, I came uh, to I'm, I'm sorry, let me jump over to Gretchen for a moment. You joined Peter when? How long ago? Uh, 1984. Help us uh, understand Peter a little more uh, as a little more complex uh, of a man than the smooth performer that he was <laughs> on the air. As you saw him behind the scenes, uh, uh, was, was, was Peter always as cool, as unflappable as he seemed to be on the air? He was, he was, no, <laughs> to be in a word. Uh, but I will tell you this, when he sat down in front of the television camera, it was as if a wall went up. That, there he was totally unflappable. And I've never seen anything quite like it. We could have the world swirling around us and some sort of crisis going on, but as soon as he sat in that anchor chair, he became a totally different person. I think the only thing that would have shaken him out of that was his children, something, something happened to his children. Mike Clementi, uh, you, you often sat quite literally next to Peter uh, when he was on the air. See if you can explain to some of our viewers uh, that, that swirling chaos that Gretchen was alluding to a moment ago, what all would be going on both in his ear and around him uh, as uh, that, that, that very cool presence appeared on the screen? I think he was frustrated, Ted, that he had a hundred stories he wanted to put on every day and we could only put on 20, maybe six or seven or eight tape pieces and eight or ten tells and he was interested in everything that passed in front of his eyes that day so he was you you saw it and Gretchen saw it it was a tornado going through the office we used to call him the flea on occasion because the attention span was all over the place but I think it was a little bit of that frustration a lot of the learning a lot of the I want to do it all and uh, at a certain point 629 59 he had to settle down and get on with the show but until then it was how many papers can I rip through? How many people can I talk to? And then ultimately put it on the air at 6.30 each night. Let's take a short break. And when we come back, I'd like each of you to give us a sense of what it was that, that made Peter Jennings a, a unique television performer and a unique journalist. Back with our guests in a moment. I'm worried that there are things that are going to burn me. A lot of confusing terms. Appraisals. I figured I could sell it on my own to save a little bit of money. Open house, that's somebody else's job. I don't even know enough to know that I don't know. The first thing we did was call a realtor. As soon as I saw that realtor R, it put me right at ease. Selling a home takes experience, commitment, and a lot of know-how. Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. For sale by owner, but not by this owner. Discover delicious citrus and berry flavors in a very surprising place. New Centrum Silver Chewables with heart-healthy nutrients that emerging science suggests may help reduce the risk of heart disease. The best of Centrum Silver in new citrus berry chewables. Oh, I should have used Preparation H. Wherever you go, take the easy way to cleanse, cool, and soothe. Preparation H Portables. Four times bigger than tux pads. Preparation H Portable Wipes. Big relief to go. Is this the help desk? Yes, sir. I need help with this. What is it? It's my invention. What's wrong with it? Nothing. So what's the problem? Everyone's going to want one. I see. My company's small. This is huge. You need to grow fast. Exactly. Can I see it? Have a look. Good music, good times. What's your favorite thing in the whole world? 
Yes? I don't know. You don't know? Well, it's good that you raised your hand, then. Today, Kevin Nealon and an all-new Jimmy Kimmel Live. Good times coming up, only on ABC. There is a book filled with all the answers. People who use this book find exactly what they're looking for. But some people use a different book, which causes problems. No other book is more complete than the SBC Yellow Pages. For more ads and up-to-date listings, choose the book with SBC on the cover. I'm here to tell you, men, we're going to rescue 500 American prisoners of war. On August 12th comes the true story of the greatest rescue mission ever attempted. The Great Raid. Rated R. In theaters Friday. If you're getting married, we'll rent you a tuxedo package for as little as 50 bucks, which is pretty good, considering her dress probably costs as much as your car. Rent four tuxedos, and the grooms is free. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. And I'm back once again with Bob Siegenthaler, Gretchen Babarovich, and Mike Clemente. Mike, let me begin this time with you. What I was trying to get to before is Peter was at his best when there was a live breaking story. And the longer he was on the air, the better he was. 9-11, I think, was a perfect example when he was on for more than 24 hours. And it is at times like that when all hell is breaking loose in the world and all hell is breaking loose in the control room and all hell is sometimes breaking loose quite literally to his immediate left and his immediate right but he was showing none of that on the air see if you can describe that for me and explain peter uh, in that sort of cauldron he had something in his head ted if you have just a moment uh, he shared this story last year when we started the 24 7 network here something his father told him about how to break down information and how to communicate information and how to go on at length when you know very little. He said that his father, when he was about to head to America, told him to go up on the roof and look in the sky and come back down and describe what he saw. And Peter said he went up on the roof and he came back down and he said, there's a moon and I saw some stars and I didn't see any airplanes. His father said, now go back on the roof and cut the sky up into four pieces and come back down and describe individually the four quadrants and he did and you probably get the point of the story his father charles taught him how to collect a ton of information how to break it down into little bits and pieces and how to simplify it and explain it to people in a way that they could understand and i think it was that combination of a ton of material in front of him and that vast interest he had in everything and a little trick that his father had given him uh, before he came down here to broadcast for good. His father, Charles Bob, was, was sometimes referred to as the Edward R. Morrow of, of Canada, and that was a model that I know uh, Peter looked up to and hoped to emulate uh, someday in his life. What do you, what do you think uh, marked him as a young journalist? most I know you've spoken about the curiosity but as a as a performer trying to become a great journalist I think we make a lot uh, out of out of Peter's uh, curiosity we don't make enough about about his crankiness he was he had good crankiness he mentioned that I think in his farewell and, and he was a person who wanted the people working with him to be as well prepared as he and he was cranky when they weren't Gretchen, uh, I, I saw a flicker of recognition on your face when Bob was talking about good crankiness. What, uh, <laughs> give, me, yes. give, me, give me your own example of Peter's good crankiness. Well, he had an incredible capacity, as Mike said, to assimilate information and then disseminate it. But he did not suffer fools lightly. And God forbid you should give him a piece of incorrect information. It wasn't fun. He never shouted, he never yelled, but you knew <laughs> right then and there that you had better get your look to your laurels. Gretchen, other than immediate members of his family, uh, you were probably closer to Peter than anyone, and I know saw him often over these last few months. Uh, he never gave up fighting, did he? No, he never gave up fighting. His spirit was so strong. And no matter how ill he felt, there would always be these flashes of what we call Peterisms. 
he had that turn of phrase or he had a wicked sense of humor that would just come flying out in one pithy sentence. And I just, I shall miss that terribly because he loved what he did, Ted. It was who he was. And every day, every day, he would listen to that morning call. He would, no matter how, if he'd had a chemo treatment, no matter how...